You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. Hi, I'm Bobby Herzberg. I'm Distinguished Senior Fellow in the F.A. Hayek Program in Advanced Studies in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics here at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. And I... uh, I joined uh, the Mercatus Center towards the end of a long academic career that actually started at uh, Indiana University, my very first job uh, with the Ostroms, uh, Lynn Ostrom as my uh, boss and uh, as department head at that time at Indiana University in political science. And so I think that's uh, one of the things that brings me here today to talk about character I very much uh, appreciate over the years. So my name is Vlad Tarko. Uh, I'm the author of Eleanor Ostrom, uh, an intellectual biography, and I'm co-author with uh, Pete Betke and Paul Alijica uh, of public governance in the classical, uh, per from a classical liberal perspective. Uh, so a lot of my work has been related to the Ostroms uh, so I'm glad to interview uh, Bobby now. Um, so f- as far as my uh, uh, affiliation, I'm, I've am i been uh, connected to the Mercatus Center for quite a while now. Um, I've been a, a PhD uh, fellow, uh, then a research fellow, and I'm still happy to be <laughs> connected to Mercatus in all sorts of ways. Uh, so from August, I'll, I'm going to be at the University of Arizona at the Department of uh, um, um, Political Economy and Moral Science. I'm excited to hear what you uh, have to say about the intellectual uh, history of the Ostroms, uh, uh, Lynn Ostrom especially. Lynn Ostrom is best known for her work on uh, common pool resource settings. Uh, but your own work on the Bloomington School notes the importance of her earlier work with Vincent Ostrom on polycentrism and metropolitan governance. Uh, can you lay out some of that work on polycentrism and metropolitan governance, especially for people who might not be as familiar with that as they are on her later work, and suggest why you think it's important for those studying the work of the Ostroms to start at that point. Yes. So um, the the earlier work that she did on um, metropolitan governance and in particular studying police departments, um, I think gave her uh, some of the early kind of examples about why polycentricity matters as a concept. Um, so. Um, the whole polycentricity um, approach has quite a long history, going back to the 1950s uh, to Michael Polony. Uh, so he was interest. So he was in Britain, and uh, at the time uh, there was this push to centralize science in Britain. Um, so they had this kind of arguments that scientists just uh, um, have these overlapping efforts. And if you just had a, a hierarchical organization of science, science would work better. Uh, and Polony thought that was crazy because you don't know what approaches are the best. So you just have to have this trial and error um, method. Uh, so he basically created this idea of polycentricity to describe h- why science works and to push back against this kind of hierarchical um, uh, organization that was proposed for science. So then in, in the 60s, Vincent Ostrom uses the word 
Um, and I think he was he, it was a coincidence at first that he used the same word as uh, Michael Polony, but then he found out about Polony and was like, oh, <laughs> this is the same thing I'm talking about. And he was concerned about uh, a push to centralize metropolitan governance. Uh, and the same arguments were uh, proposed there. Like um, uh, they were saying, well, you have these local uh, smaller jurisdictions and they overlap in their efforts, therefore you have wasted uh, uh, resources. Um, and basically there was also like um, um, an economy of scale argument that a larger scale um, metropolitan uh, jurisdiction could do things better. The same argument was given in science that you would just, the big science would work better than just the smaller labs or something like that. Uh, so it was a very similar kind of argument, but in a very different area. Uh, so uh, yeah, so with metropolitan governance, the thing is uh, we have all this, historically all these small towns that grew and we ended up with a single metropolitan area but which has the historical organization of the small towns. So when the metropolitan area formed, that's when people started to think maybe we should reorganize how, it's o how it, the administration works. Uh, so Vincent Ostrom basically um, with uh, uh, Tibu and with Warren they have this paper in 61 uh, where they push against the, the, the call to centralize metropolitan governance. And it's somewhat of a theoretical um, uh, argument and is making use of this polycentricity. Uh, and then in the 70s, uh, Eleanor Ostrom uh, starts to look at this um, so the story is that um, basically she was sick of water governance because she's done so much water governance and she asked her students, this is the first time she's coordinating PhD students and she's asking them, okay, choose anything but water governance. Uh, so they chose metropolitan governance. So they look, okay, let's look at police departments as an application of this. So when they look at that, the first thing they notice is that people who are calling for uh, centralizing police departments, they didn't really understand how actual police departments worked. So for example, uh, there are these kind of tasks that police is doing, like patrol, uh, like you have crime labs, you have jails, um, all kinds of activities, uh, training, so these have different economies of scale. So what they discovered was that it was not the case that every single police department was doing all these tasks and therefore not taking advantage of economies of scale, duplicating their efforts. And in fact, there was a lot of cooperation, kind of an informal cooperation so they were doing the smaller scale things that they were good at doing and then say with crime labs, they were contracting a bigger crime lab or they were sharing the same kind of jail. Uh, so they discovered that basically the people who are pushing to centralize police departments, they did not understand how police departments were actually organized. Uh, and police departments were organized in this polycentric fashion where you have multiple departments and they cooperate on various tasks. They are independent on other tasks. Uh, so the, the concept of polycentricity, which was kind of a theoretical thing, became much thicker. And that is, that is uh, it was part of the legend by the time I arrived at the workshop, uh, but that those police studies and the metropolitan studies and going out to the field um, were a, a very critical part of the empirical um, structure of, of the workshop. Uh, one of the things that Lynn was always pressing, and I think this did come from her sense of how are we going to explain this to people, 
was the need to demonstrate in a way that could be believed by others who were not there doing the field work. And so how are you going to um, convince others who thought you could go a different way? Uh, can you speak at all to the way in which they tried to um, sort of resolve people's uh, skepticism about yeah. uh, what they were finding and, and the way in which they were measuring uh, things in those metropolitan studies? Yeah, so different people have different sources of skepticism, so they basically try to address all of them. So, f say, some people, um, so for example, they describe case studies, so they would actually take one case and tell you, here's how police is organized in North Carolina. Uh, so then you get this example, you see it, like, no, this is ex how they are actually organized. So you see those limitations of the theoretical models that others are pushing. Uh, but then, of course, just looking at a case study, that's not very convincing in itself. So then, uh, so they started with some case studies uh, in Indianapolis and comparing uh, uh, centralized police departments with the decentralized police departments. But then that was not very convincing to more statistically oriented people. So they had a giant uh, study, uh, I think it's still the largest study of police departments, where they did the same study repeated all over the country in all the metropolitan areas. Uh, so that's kind of more convincing to a statistically minded person. Uh, and then there was this issue about how do you measure the efficiency of a police department or the, their performance. Uh, so to them, it sounded like, okay, the police is basically providing services to citizens. So, of course, you would ask the citizens how, how uh, the, about the performance of the police. So they were doing surveys, uh, asking people, you know, various questions, like standard questions about the performance of the police. But then they got this pushback uh, that people were thinking, well, what do people know? <laughs> The, uh, you know, basically... The ignorant human. Yeah. So n they wanted something more objective. Uh, so this was kind of part of their economic argument that when they were first looking at police, police is evaluating their performance, but they are evaluating their performance based on inputs, basically, like how many people you're uh, arresting and stuff like that. That... but. That's not the output of is it safe on the street, right? right? So they were critical of the way the police was measuring, in the, they were measuring internally their own performance. So that's why they started doing the surveys because they wanted mm. to see the actual um, performance as far as the citizen's perspective is concerned. But then there was this idea, well, perhaps the citizens just don't know anything about uh, uh, the performance of anything, not just the police, but any kind of public service. So there was this uh, s very big skepticism kind of related to s the subjective perspective that people have. Uh, so then they basically try to compare subjective perspectives in surveys with more objective um, uh, measures. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, they did this not necessarily with police, but with other public services. So, for example, they were looking at the quality of other public services like roads. So you would ask people, you know, well, how good are the roads? They would give you their subjective opinion about their roads. But then they uh, had this thing created by the Urban Institute where they would measure they would actually go on the road and measure, you know, how bumpy the road is. Right. We now the roughometer. Yeah. So now we have an app that <laughs> does that. So basically they were like doing this uh, early thing. So they were comparing the actual roughness of the road right. with the with people's subjective uh, perspectives on it. They, they were matching. Uh, so 
the the only uh error basically that they found that people are making is about um light i think mm -hmm. so w you would ask people you know how uh, are the streets properly uh, lit at night and if uh, if they w they are properly lit near their house they say yeah it's properly lit in the entire <laughs> neighborhood <laughs> so that was kind of the only right uh, major error that people's subjective views uh have so this is interesting because we have a lot of evidence of people's kind of failures of this subjective perspective at large scale issues Mm -hmm. Right, but now when you're talking about local uh, government issues, people are far more better informed. <laughs> right, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, so that's kind of how they try to address various sources of skepticism, like you know the limits of case studies, but then the limits of just pure theoretical models, uh, the limits of just statistical analysis when you don't really measure properly the performance and we so see all these themes coming out as she moves to her common pool resource and her institutional exactly. analysis yeah. later yeah right because we do see um, that sensitivity to multiple ways of measuring and multiple ways of analyzing uh, a particular setting so yeah so I think this is something that's very important in the framework she develops. The fact that um, you do not just evaluate institutions, the outcomes uh, based on some objective way. It's just uh, she acknowledges that different people will uh, care about different things, about if will evaluate the outcomes differently. There are going to be trade-offs between different uh, uh, ways of evaluating, different things you care about. Uh, so then you, you, you cannot just have uh, this kind of purely objective evaluation of how good the institutions are doing. You'll have different people evaluating differently because they weight different criteria differently. So then the question is, how do you have these people with different uh, values come together to improve institutions kind of from everyone's perspective. Right. And th well, that was very much a part of her work, too. Um, and what she is best known for um, is that sort of distinctive feature of treating individuals as capable of governing themselves uh, collectively and solving difficult social dilemmas. And so um, can you explain or outline how she approached or how the Ostroms approached um, understanding collective dilemmas through the perspective as seen like a citizen uh, rather than seen like a state? and uh, whether or not there, you think their optimism was appropriate in that setting. Uh, so why did they believe that individual citizens were capable of coming up with good solutions? Why did they think that individual citizens were capable of judging how the streets were or how the police were? Um, what was it about their optimism regarding yeah, so the, the usual story is that Harding publishes the tragedy of the Commons paper, and then later on, uh, Eleanor Ostrom shows that there are limits to Harding's argument. But actually, uh, when they saw that paper, they were kind of upset because they had already seen and published about how people w were solving these dilemmas. So basically, that paper was a super simplified perspective on something that they already knew that it was a much more complicated reality. So um, on the other hand, that tragedy of the commons argument is a very neat theoretical argument, especially when you put it in a, a game theoretical framework. Uh, so. Eleanor Ostrom's uh, approach to this in the gover in governing the commons is to acknowledge 
the logic of the prisoner's dilemma that it leads you to this uh, mutual defection uh, situation that none of the participants want, but it's just the nature of the incentives they have to end up in that uh, bad situation. However, she points out that people are not helpless in, and stuck in just in a prisoner's dilemma. So once you acknowledge that, well, we are in this uh, inferior equilibrium, we don't like it here. Why are we here, right? So we're trying. To, we're beginning to understand the logic of the situation that pushes us uh, in the bad uh, outcome. Then we figure out how to change the rules. Uh, so how to create, say, punishes, punishments, how to subsidize things. So that will basically change the payoffs of the game. So it's no longer a prisoner's dilemma. It's like an assurance game or, or, or it's a stag hunt. And that has cooperative equilibria. So once, okay, so on a purely uh, game theoretical th uh, um, level, right, she makes this very important point that peop people are changing the games. So then you have, when you're thinking of equilibrium, you have to think not just the equilibrium within a game, but equilibrium within this uh, process that changes the game. Right, so sometimes in, you may not be able to change the game because of transaction costs. Uh, so then you are, you can be stuck in a prisoner's dilemma, although in principle you could escape it. Uh, right. <laughs> so, but what the drive for this was empirical. They just observed that people are not in fact stuck in prisoner's dilemma. So then they were curious, okay, what are they doing? <laughs> Right. So, so what they are doing is basically creating rules and enforcing the rules. And it's uh, often very interesting to look at what exactly the rules are. So to give you examples, um, say you think of something like a fishing village and they have an overfishing problem. Mm -hmm. And you ask an economist, okay, how would you solve this? And uh, it's when you actually <laughs> ask economists, they would think, Okay, so the problem is they're overfishing, they, so then you have to limit how much they uh, fish. So the solution would be to check how much everyone has uh, uh, gathered and put a restraint on that. That's a terrible rule because it's very costly to monitor every fisherman. Right? So it's basically impossible to do. So what uh, uh, actual fishing villages do, they restrict the time when you're allowed to go fishing. So say when uh, when there's a spawning season, you're not allowed to go fishing. And it's very easy to notice if someone is uh, the lone fisherman going going out, right? So that's very easy to monitor. <laughs> right, so you design institutional rules that can be enforced and carried out. Yeah. During this, um, the period of time that Lynn is starting to develop um, her work on the commons uh, and thinking about it from this perspective that citizens can participate, um, she's working through these institutional rules because that was the key, right. it seems, yeah. for how they were able to get around these, um, these tragedies. But one of the criticisms of the time, and this came out when she made her address to the Public Choice Society as pres her presidential address, she did it on institutional analysis and why it was so important to understand institutions. Uh, and that precedes then governing the commons. But when she makes that, she gets a lot of pushback. Well, you can never explain all the institutions. You can never analytically do that. So how do you think they started to sort of come together to bring analytic rigor to this many, 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 many types of institutional problem uh, that they're observing out there. Every time you see one village, you've seen one village. And so not falling into the problem of 
uh, the anthropologist that wants to try and generalize. So she wanted to generalize. How yeah. do you go about doing that? Yeah, and this connects to the, the question about the optimism. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so it, um, the way in which she approached this, um, so first of all, that's true. That critic is, is correct, that indeed there are so many different institutions, you cannot just map them all out. And uh, she emphasizes this a lot uh, when she's talking about um, learning from one place to another, right? So you see, say, forests in Switzerland, they are properly managed, and you're thinking, okay, now we're going to manage all the forests in the world with the exact same rules as in Switzerland. It will not work because there, there are details about those forests there that will not... Uh, be the same in other places and those details really matter for the success or failure of the management. Uh, so it is true that you have all these kind of details that require uh, s very specific institutions. So her solution to this uh, dilemma is to go one level up. So instead of asking what exactly, what are the rules that we should have to manage the forest, She's asking, what uh, institutions should we have to discuss about how we're creating the rules about managing the forest? Right? So the, the rules are at this public choice level where you're thinking, OK, how are people interacting to create the rules? So th those are, uh, it's simpler to think that way in a sense. Um, the, and that's where you can get some generalization, right? So this is the main thing that she's building in the governing the commons. She's basically trying to figure out which communities succeed and which fail. Why do they succeed or fail? Uh, well, ultimately, they fail because the, the rules they're creating are not good or they cannot enforce them properly. But why is it that some communities create rules that they are good and they are enforceable while other communities are not? Uh, so the reason is has to do with how the kind of political interactions happen in one place or another. So um, she calls these design principles. It's basically uh, some kind of criteria about how people should interact to create rules. So she basically finds that kind of has a, a list of criteria and um, she basically looks at many different case studies and finds that those uh, uh, communities that fulfill those uh, principles, they tend to be successful in creating whatever rules are appropriate for their specific situation, while other um, uh, communities that do not kind of uh, interact that way, then they are less likely to f uh, succeed. So the, there are often some of these criteria are things like, uh, say, if we're creating a rule that asks you, uh, okay, so say we're building an irrigation system. So some irrigation systems are very successful, others complete failure. So you see that, say, in, in a successful irrigation system, if I ask you to contribute this much time and effort to fix the irrigation system, we have to repair it every once in a while, then you're going to get a proportional benefit from it. Right? So there's no this kind of exploitation. W so when, and if that doesn't happen, people feel exploited, and they're just not going to uh, repair the system. Uh, <laughs> So then the whole thing collapses because you cannot just monitor everyone and be with the stick there and force them to do the work properly. So there's this kind of rules that about how people interact, uh, what can it, are the rules fair, uh, um, so, or the rules like if you have a group of people who's creating rules for everyone else and everyone else is not involved in creating those rules, that's more likely to fail. Right? Even if those that group, 
that creates the rules is well intentioned. Like like uh, say uh, you have NGOs that come to some place and they want to help, but it's not it often fails and it, it can fail because of knowledge reasons, right? All these people who are the the ultimate stakeholders, they know things that you as an outsider may not know, or if you and uh, there are also obvious incentive problems like if you have an elite group that just makes rules for others they make make rules that just benefit themselves rather than everyone right so it's this kind of criteria at the uh, at the level of how people interact to create rules rather than looking at very detailed level of policy um so her optimism it's a very guarded optimism. Right? So governing the commons has many examples of failures, and she's explaining the failures as well as the op uh, the successes. And so she's not just saying people will succeed at this right. every time. No, they will not. Uh, and that's kind of the key to understand why they will not succeed sometimes. Exactly. Um, I know that you and I certainly agree that uh, Lynn Ostrom was more than uh, deserving of the Nobel Prize in economics um, and being the first woman to win the Nobel Prize. And so we agree on that, and I think many people agree on that. But some people uh, at the time um, had the perception that they wondered why it was that she had won the Nobel Prize and what made her work uh, stand out in a way that would attract the Nobel Committee and others uh, uh, to grant her this great honor. Um, so can you explain to us what it is and uh, explain to listeners what it might be that made her worthy of such um, an honor at that point? Yeah, so this I think this shows something very interesting about how the economics profession is organized. So on one hand, the, the Nobel Prize is sometimes given even to non-economists. Like, so she was mainly a political scientist. They gave the prize to Kahneman, who's mainly a psychologist. So on one hand, economists seem to be very generous in with their attention going even outside of economics and uh, having this great uh, uh, reward for people who are not even economists. But on the other hand, the surprise say that people have, say with Elena Rostrom or uh, others, um, shows you that a lot of economists only pay attention to a small subset even of economics. I saw people say in public choice were not surprised that she got the Nobel Prize. Right? They thought this was uh, an obvious thing. Uh, right? So in our circle, intellectual circle, we were wondering for a long time when is she getting the Nobel Prize. Right? So it wasn't a surprise in certain areas of economics, like in institutional economics, in environmental economics, in, in public choice. Uh, but then, for people who are not working in these areas, it took them by surprise. And that shows you, well, they're not paying attention to economics as a whole, right? So I, there's kind of this interesting contradiction. On one hand, you have the Nobel Committee who pays attention very broadly. And on the other hand, you have many, you know, even prominent economists who pay attention only to a tiny part even of economics, they don't read everything that's published in a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so why what is what is about her work that uh, um, uh, was worthy of this prize, right? So the uh, the Nobel Prize was already uh, offered for uh, various institutional economics, right? So Doug North won it, uh, Coase won it. So her work. Uh, and Williams, Williamson, uh, 
it's a it's a natural uh continuation of that I of those interests right so what she did was um a much more detailed institutional uh, analysis than say coase did right so I it's kind of building the knowledge base that we have on institutions, how to analyze institutions, the thing I was saying earlier about the design principles, right? That's an extraordinary work that I involved this analysis of hundreds of case studies, um, right? It involved this concept of polycentricity that they created as a way to understand complex social order, um, right? As a way to understand um, emergent orders that are not governed by prices right this is kind of a very interesting thing that they're building um right so we have this understanding of how prices help coordinate large groups of people but what we also see people coordinating in areas that don't have prices so we need an understanding of that so polycentricity is a way to think about an emergent order even when there's no prices there to do the coordination. So you can still think about how coordination happens or doesn't happen you know, with this kind of institutional uh, analysis. So it's very important work and it's in a sense at the core of economics, this uh, concern about understanding emergent social orders. So... Uh, yeah, it's, it's not surprising, that, and it wasn't surprising to people who were familiar with the work. Right, uh, right. And there are reasons why she was not uh, uh, in an economics department or with an economics PhD uh, that go back to her graduate school days. Uh, she was not admitted to UCLA's um, economics department to obtain a PhD. There's an interesting uh, side note there that she took economics with Alchin. Oh, yes. <laughs> who's, who's a famous uh, Well, <laughs> she wanted to take those courses, and she knew she, this is the area she wanted to do, but she did not have the mathematics. As a woman, she had not <laughs> been encouraged to do mathematics at the level that was necessary mm -hmm. uh, to enter their PhD program. They didn't want to waste uh, fellowship on her uh, that year and she didn't have the means mm -hmm. uh, to go without and so um, they recommended actually that she do political science and that she could come over and take particular courses so I always found that a little bit irritating when people would say she's not even an economist I would always come back well not for lack of wanting to be an economist and working uh, at being an economist, so yeah, it's a bit ironic because some of the pushback she gets in political science is that she's too much of an economist. Absolutely, <laughs> she's way too analytic. And uh, what are you doing with that? That's not politics. Uh, so yeah, she got it pushed back and and managed to rise above all of it. And they were very committed to doing uh, interdisciplinary work. Right. It was one of the things that she always surrounded herself uh, with uh, people from different disciplines because she thought that brought yeah. new insights into it. And I know you've, uh, you've written on that. If there's a piece beyond governing the commons, which I think is what most people associate with uh, Lynn Ostrom and, um, and her Nobel success, um, that you would recommend to someone that they absolutely should read, um, what would it be and why is that the case? So it would be um, Understanding Institutional Diversity, the book in, published in 2005, which is in, a, in many ways the follow-up to Governing the Commons. Uh, so that book. I'm going to actually press you on that because while it is the follow up in book, the IAD framework, which is sort True. of the core of that, actually precedes the governing the commons back at the time she was True. doing her public choice uh, presidential address. Yeah. 
this is something that I think she worked until the end. Like she wasn't, she was never certain. Say, are did I find the proper design principles? Uh, she kind of the 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 list of design principles in understanding institutional diversity is slightly different than in the governing the commons. And I think like one of her last um, papers uh, is also about you know why are these design principles working or not. Uh, <laughs> so there, yeah. So in a sense, understanding institutional diversity, the work there is dating back decades. But it, that's kind of um, a m more updated. Well, what she thought was an an update to the framework, uh, and and that book has more than just the framework. Right? So, for instance, has a um, a paper with uh, uh, Crawford mm -hmm. on social norms, mm -hmm. which is um, a very interesting um, kind of analytic description of how you would describe informal norms which she has to do that because in in her uh, analysis of case studies she discovers that many rules are informal so you're just looking at the rules on paper and that's not how the society works so then we have this uh, uh, aspect of her thinking right that we we were discussing that She's not just looking at uh, empirics and kind of describing what's there. Once she describes what's there, she finds puzzles, and now she's thinking, okay, how do we improve our theory, like our math, basically, uh, to understand those puzzles? So now she's building this theory of social norms to make sense of <laughs> what she sees about social norms in the real world. Uh, so it's this very interesting um, analytic uh, uh, construction. And uh, the last chapter in that book is about polycentricity, and it may be the most uh, uh, advanced account that she gave about polycentricity. Her noble address is also about polycentricity, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it, th that last chapter may be even better. Um, so I, there's a lot. I would agree. I think that one really brings together all of the different components of her work in this area. And it's yeah. much broader than simply in the common pool resource. I know at the end of her life, uh, she had started to move into even broader frameworks and broader models on uh, social and ecological um, culture and other areas um, in developing new frameworks. Um, we don't know where that would have gone yeah. um, had she not passed early. But well, so others are continuing. Others are that. continuing so this. That's some of the most interesting work uh, on the empirical side. Right. So one of the uh, criticisms she gets about the about governing the commons is that all the examples are small communities. So then this work that's now, uh, uh, th there's like a, a project at Dartmouth that builds this, uh, it's called Social Ecological Systems Framework, which is kind of a, a, a bigger scale framework. Um, yeah, so they're trying to have a way to think about much larger systems. So she has some some on that, like she has a paper on global warming that's mm -hmm. kind of interesting because it's maybe we can talk about that, uh, right? Because most people who think about global warming think, okay, this is a global problem, therefore it requires a global uh, policy. But she is adopting this polycentric perspective on it and says, uh, okay, you can actually solve the problem by having many different uh, uh, solutions working at the same time. So each solution by itself is not very promising because it's a local, uh, you know, like say United States will have some policy. 
or you in Europe you have some policy that's not gonna make a dent by itself but you can have all these different countries having different policies and then they add up as a possible solution and that would take into account this kind of political uh, um, uh, details that otherwise make pol th this kind of policy impossible so I thought that was an interesting uh, perspective and it kind of goes back to the police studies and the the work on the commons and it, that's something that you see all the time that you the fact that is a large scale problem doesn't necessarily mean that you need the large scale jurisdiction to be in charge of that problem because you often see these uh, polycentric systems that solve the problem in kind of this emergent fashion uh, so she goes from like metropolitan area police departments, this kind of small scale uh, fishing villages and uh, forest management and irrigation. And then she's thinking all the way to like global commons. Uh, it suggests the sort of wide range of questions and concerns that one can uh, tackle using the sort of Ostrom um, perspective. And I think at the end of the day, um, it suggests that they developed a very rich right. um, approach. The workshop logic of building teams and uh, working collaboratively uh, to tackle some of these, I think, was a really important way um, to take on the biggest problems we face. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason, as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.